great for, for God that walks through us, being with us every step of the way. If you have your Bibles, turn them to uh, Genesis chapter number 14. Try to pick up where uh, I was headed last week. I got uh, derailed and went in a different direction last week, so I'm going to try to pick up and go from there. You got your Bible? Thank you all for coming today. Thank you for coming. All, the, all of those that are watching online, thanks for uh, streaming with us. If you have your Bible, stand up with us in honor of God's Word. We stand in allegiance. We stand in uh, awe. We stand and are grateful for what God has done for us. I'm going to begin Genesis chapter 14 in verse number 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley, after his return from the, the, the defeat of Tredorla Omer and the kings who were with him. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him, gave him a tithe of all. Look at that phrase again. He gave him a tithe of all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, I thank you once again for the privilege to be able to preach your word. I thank you for those who love you, those who honor you, who are in the building today, and those who are watching online. Father, we are living in a, a very different day, Lord, a very a day full of uh, uh, hardship and circumstances that are difficult, but God, you have not changed. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever, and Lord, we come today in our circumstances to worship you. So Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for calling us to your word. We uh, thank you for all the goodness of all your word, and we pray, Lord, blessings upon you, Holy Spirit, as you will speak the word to our hearts. May we honor you. May you uh, be drawn close to you. May you meet us here with this truth. And Lord, may we be changed into your likeness. Father, you know what I mean when I say these words. May you increase, but Lord, may we decrease so that the bounty of you can be the blessings that come to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Most of us want the miracles without the circumstances that demand the miracles. Most of us want the blessings without the circumstances that reveal the blessings. We just sing victory in Jesus. And I love that song. But most of us in our walk with God, we look at it this way. We're walking forward towards victory. But when I met God, the cross was done. When I met God, he had already traveled the road, taking him to the cross where he gave his life a ransom for my sin. What can wash my, away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He went to the cross, through the grave, and came out victorious on the other side. So when I met Christ, I met the victorious, overcoming Christ, who is Lord of my heart and my life. He is my God. He is my Savior. And praise God, He is my friend. I don't travel for victory, but because I'm with Christ, walking with Him in a relationship with Him, I'm traveling from victory. I don't travel with God so that I can have victory, but because, not my circumstances are not, that, that's just what I'm walking through, but because I have a victory in Jesus, that's what I'm walking towards. Circumstances may make us feel defeated, hard, dreary, depressed, but really what happens is circumstances reveal what's already there. We're in this study called Faith and blessings and we know that there is a God in heaven who loves us beyond anything we could ever comprehend and he wants a relationship with us and he wants to because he's a God of love he wants to pour out his love upon us but we see God we meet God we understand him we come to him by faith so as we're walking through circumstances 
Though it may be difficult, though it may be hard, it really, all it does is reveal where we really already are. It reveals our, our thoughts towards him. Some people, I think they're waiting for God to overcome. But I'm here to tell you, God's already overcome. When they pray, they're saying, oh, Lord, look at this difficulty. Look at this pandemic. Look at all this. Look at all this. Lord, would you come? He's already here. He's already looked at it. He's already amended. it. He's already okayed it. God is God that's bigger than that. And for us, worship should be the expression of what we believe about God, no matter our circumstances. No matter what our circumstances tell us, our heart should tell us something else. So let's look at the circumstances that Abraham was going through. Number one, Abraham was living in peace. He had found his place. He was there. He was at peace with all of his neighbors. He was at peace with God. He was good. But Lot, his nephew, had gone in a different direction, and he had found himself in harm's way. He had been taken uh, captive in battle. He had lost everything that, that he had owned, his family, and he himself were taken captives by that. Word came back to Abram. So Abram went to hell. He didn't question it. Love demanded it. Because he loved his nephew, because he was in harm's way, he went after that. So Abram took his 318 trained servants, and he began the journey south, about 75 miles from where he was staying. And, and he found the, the enemy there, and when he found them, it was night, and he began the attack then. He didn't rest. He began the attack then. He even divided his uh, troops. I mean, it really didn't look like it would be the most advantageous time. But he began the battle. He attacked. And with God's help, he began to chase the enemy. And for 200 miles, he chased the enemy north, defeating them again and again and again. He didn't stop. He didn't quit. He had to be weary. He had to be tired. He had to say, Lord, I, I, I've done what I'm here for. I'm just going to stop here. He went forward, and, and he, he didn't give up on the verge of a miracle. He walked it out. 200 miles of travel. Gideon didn't have that. Gideon had a, a, an unbelievable circumstances, but God came through and gave him a victory. Joshua at Jericho. He was there before the walled city, the mighty city. But, but he did what God told him to do. And, and they took the step back, clapped their hands, blew the trumpet, and the walls came tumbling down. And they rushed in and took the booty of battle. But Abram had to fight the battle for 200 tiring, weary, battle-worn miles. But he took it every step of the way. God gave him the victory. The battle belongs to the Lord. Then Abram came back. And he came back to his place that was there. And in verse 17 it says, and, and the kings that had been defeated, they came back and they met uh, Abram there in the, the valley of kings. And, and I, don't you know they wanted to have a party? Don't you know they wanted to have a victory time? Don't you know? I mean, they were wanting to celebrate Abram's victory. They were probably hoping, and, and we know that they were, they were hoping that they could get some of the benefit uh, of Abram's victory, and they could take part of that back too. But then we get to verse 18. It's like all the kings met him. That really didn't interest him. The party really wasn't what got Abram excited. Because in verse 18, God's priest shows up. His name is Melchizedek, and that got Abram's attention. Now, Melchizedek means king of justice, king of justice. I know sometimes we look at circumstances of the world and we say, where's the justice? Where's God in this? But God is a God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always been loving. He always will be loving. He's always been right. He'll always be and do that is right. He is holy no matter what, and the representation of God is exactly that. He, Melchizedek was also called 
king of Salem, Salem means peace, it's really the word that was used for the city of Jerusalem, king of peace. Peace with God. Priest of the Most High God. El Elyon. El means God. Elyon, Most High. He was the one who knew the Most High God. And he's priest. The word priest means intercessor or the one who goes between. Now this is a lovely picture. Melchizedek shows up and, and his he is described in Hebrews 5, 6, and 7 in much more detail. I don't have time to go into all that today. I'm just going to stay on the theme of Genesis 14 here. But, but the priest of the Most High comes, and, and here's the word priest, the go-between. It's like he goes to the throne of grace, the throne of the God of Most High. He knows the God Most High. He worships the God Most High. He has been called out, ordained by God. To be the go-between. So Melchizedek, it's like he goes and he grabs the hold of God. Then he reaches down to old sinful man that we are. And he intercedes between the two. He's the go-between between the two. So tired and weary, Abram comes home. He doesn't want to hear the praise of men. He's not interested in what they say or what, he, what they want from him. But, but when God's man comes, his heart immediately comes in worship. And he comes with Melchizedek. And Melchizedek's there. And, and, and I can just get the picture as Abraham falls down and Melchizedek puts his head upon Abraham and reaches up a hand to heaven. And look at the words that it says there in verse number 19. The Bible says, and he blessed him. The one who could bring the blessings of God. Man, that's powerful. To think that because you are ordained of God, brought by God, to know the promises of God and not to hold them for yourself, but to deliver them. These are God's words, God's blessing. It literally means, the word blessed means anointed. God's anointed truth and blessing and words of favor. He says, blessed be Abram of the God Most High. He said, I know who you are. Abram, I know who you are. As far as we know, this is the first time they ever met. But you know the ones that are God's people. And he meets them there and he says, Blessed are you. The, who, you, are, you belong to El Elyon, Most High, Possessor of Heaven and Earth. Oh, there's a God. He is great. He has it all. Listen, he controls it all. He owns it all. It can't do anything without the sovereign hand, providential care of God being there for us. Oh, Abram, you're in relationship with God. Oh, Abram, you're walking out your day with the blessings of God over you. You see, when he heard Lot was in need, he didn't have to decide. He already knew it. He knew what he had to do. He knew God. He didn't, have to, he didn't go and say, hey, let's have a prayer meeting so we can decide if this is what, is God going to bless this? He said, oh, no, no. I serve the one. I walk with that one. God can. He didn't have to say, is my army good enough? I've only got 318, but they were ready. They were in allegiance. So they went. Melchizedek says, blessed be this Abram, anointed. The Most High God is with you. He owns it all, and he's with you. But then he turns it there and he says, and blessed be El Elyon, the God Most High, who has delivered you who has walked with you, who has strengthened you, who has given you help in your circumstances before the enemy. He is there for you. Blessed be the God Most High who has delivered you, your enemies, into your hand. Abram, don't ever be deceived. You have what you have 
by the providence and sovereignty of God. My friends, listen. I don't care how talented you are. I don't care how talented or I don't care how, how all the, the hard working you are. I don't care how you've done all these things in life. You have what you have because you stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. You can be successful in this world and not successful and have peace in your heart. You can have all that this world can give you and still be on a dead-end road to nowhere. Today I'm going to do a funeral of a dear friend of mine. He's a church member of mine, but before that, well, really, he was a church member before he became my friend, but I tell you what, he became a dear friend of mine. I'm going to, 52 years old, and I'm going to be there, but you know, what's most important is that my friend Todd met the Lord and walked with him every step of the way. By the way, he walked through this crisis. His body was weakened before any of this crisis began. He was going for dialysis. They sent him to the hospital because he had a temperature. Six weeks in the hospital. But he had an episode about a, a week into the hospital. COVID. Don't know where it came from. Don't know who he was with. Don't know any of those things. And sometimes God heals. I have two preacher friends that have COVID. They're going to be just fine. They're not preaching today. I get the honor to preach. Both of them are not preaching today. They're going to be just fine. Sometimes God in his will will put hands of blessings and healing on some. And sometimes he'll bring a permanent healing on another. Not healing in this earth, but he'll take them to be at home in heaven. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. No longer looking at these circumstances, but looking at the blessings of God. You can't scare me with heaven. You can't scare me with peace. You can't scare me with what I've always hoped for and wanted and lived for and coveted that I will never want to leave, that I will always shout and praise God for. You see, circumstances in this world, it may be dark and dreary, but we serve a one who's overcome. Can't be defined by this world. We, that's the one we need to bow the knee to. That's the one we need to come before. We need to understand that he can deliver. He will deliver. He's the most high. He's the priest of all. He blessed him. He blessed him. And then look at that last phrase there in verse number 20. And he gave. He gave him, that is Melchizedek, a tithe of all. This is the first mention that we have in Scripture of tithing. Tithing is an act of worship. Tithing comes from your heart where because of your great love for God, you're giving back to God who already owns everything. You come before God and you say, God, I have what I have because of you. I stand today because of your love and your goodness and your grace and your mercy and your kindness reaching out and bestowing upon, upon me. So God, out of love, let me give to you the first of what you have blessed me with. Everything that he had taken, everything was there. He gave the first fruits of it unto God. It was an act of worship. So let's talk about tithing. I've been your pastor. I, Wednesday night, I said, I've been your pastor 18 months. My wife corrected me and said, it's been 17 months. I'm working on my 18th month. Haven't really talked much about tithing. In between the first service and second service, I went out to my car. Uh, my phone was there. I looked at it, and I already got a text from one church member said, Pastor, good job. I thought, well, there's somebody that believes in tithing. I, I tell you, tithing gets a bad rap. From the unbelievers, tithing gets a bad rap from the non-worshippers and the non-participants. It's like they're on the outside looking through the glass in and they see this thing 
in, in the relationship with God called tithing, and they don't understand it, and they don't want to understand it, and, and, and they don't think that it's for them, and they can't believe God there, they can't trust God there, and, and they, they just don't understand. They want the benefits of God. They want the blessing of God. They just don't know that. A, why is it that God expects or wants us to do it in this way? Why, why can't he just take the worship the way I give it? Why is it that he wants it? I, I'm just here to tell you that, that Abram came and gave the tithe unto the priest of, of the Lord. Now, when I get to the end of my days, I'm going to do Todd's funeral this afternoon. But when I get to the end of my days, I don't think I'm ever going to say, I read my Bible too much. I don't think I'm ever going to say, I prayed too much. I don't think I'm ever going to say when I come to the end of my days, I loved too much. I served too much. I was generous too much. I don't think I, when I get to the end of my days, I'm going to say, I shared Christ too much. I worshiped too much. I gave too much. I don't think that's the way I'm going to say. Tithe means tenth. People say, where do we get 10%? It's what the word tithe means. He gave the first fruits. Now, by the way, if you make $100 million, if you do, I need to talk to you. Amen. Or if you make minimum wage, 10% is the same for both. It's 10%. That means it's the first fruit off the top that you give unto the Lord. And then I give an offering every week too. Let me, let me explain this. Um, I'm your pastor and you, you give me uh, my, my salary or my wages here And that's not a secret. We publish it. It's on pieces of paper out there. Anybody that wants to know it, you can have it. I know some that say uh, they they just put down all the salaries together so it looks kind of, you know, you don't know who makes what. No, mine is line item right there. So you can see exactly what what I get. And when I I get my pay, my, my package together, I pay my insurance. I pay $423 a week in insurance. But before I pay that insurance, I pay my tithe. Then after that, I have something called a housing allowance, a pastor's allowance. Because uh, I'm in the ministry, the IRS allows me to take certain things out so that I don't have to be taxed on that. Now, I believe in paying every bit of tax that I'm supposed to, but I don't believe in paying one penny more than I have to. Can y'all get an amen on that? So, But before that housing allowance comes out, I pay my tithe on it. So I pay my insurance, but I pay my tithe first. I get my housing allowance, but I pay my tithe first. And then I get my salary. But before I get that salary, I pay my tithe first. I put my 10% in before I do anything else. Somebody asked me the question one time, do you tithe on gross or do you tithe on net? My spiritual gift is being a smart aleck. So I looked at him and said, do you want the blessings on the gross or do you want the blessings on the net? Do you trust God for the gross, or do you only trust God for the net? You see, there's all kinds of ways that we can look at things and decide if we're going to be faithful or not. But I believe we just say, here it is, Lord. You, you're the lover of all. You're the giver of all. I have all that I have because of you. Here I am. I bless you. But I'm here to tell you, when I give my tithe, I factor in an offering in addition to that every week. You can't give an offering until you've given your tithe. Now, some people want to praise God on the mountaintop. So they'll look up, and when all things are good and their wallet's full, they'll look out and say, hey, I got a little extra this month. By the way, I don't know if the camera can get that. (laughs) There's dust in there. And they'll, they'll reach in there and they'll say, let me put a little in. Let me put a little in. Let me give, you know what that's called? That's not called tithing. That's called tipping. Sometimes there's an amen moment. Sometimes there's an oh me moment. That's called tipping, right? But if you give your tithe, then you can give to the Lord. 
you give that which is worship that is rightfully his you come to that and say god you're god of my life you're god of all my life so i'm going to give you the first fruits of everything that you've bestowed upon me listen there's a word for that called stewardship god has given me a and i am the steward of everything that he's given me and because i trust him in that because he's lord of all i'll give him his first then i give an offering then i take certain monies now it might, my wallet was empty right there, but it wasn't empty a little earlier. Because you see, there are opportunities and there are times then you can come and, and there's a need that arises and you don't know that need before it arises. God just allows you to see it and be a part of it. And when that, I look at that as that money doesn't belong to me either. And I think that's when you can join up with God. When Jesus walked his day, when Jesus walked the path that God placed before him, he found needs along the way. And my Lord always met needs. You see, if you give your tithe, then God knows he can bestow even more on you. I tell you, the most generous people that I've met in all my life are those who honor God with their substance, with all of their substance. And there's something special about it. There's something amazing about it. Because I have learned and determined that I cannot outgive my God. One of the deacons and I were talking after the first service, and they talked about when, when they got married, uh, the, the one that they married was tithing, and they weren't. And they made up their mind that they were going to do that. And I said, yes, when, when I got married, I don't think you can have two people in charge of the checkbook. And I was a financial planner at that time, and I was having to do all. But I looked at my wife, and I said, you're great at this. The checkbook's yours. You pay the bills. You do all that kind of stuff. I said, but the one thing is, we're going to pay our tithe first. My wife looked at me, and she said, absolutely. And we've never had a fuss. We've never had a fight. We've never had a disagreement. We've never even had a crossword. We've never even come close to about if we're going to give to God. We made up our mind years ago that we were going to give to God period and God has taken care now sometimes I kind of felt like the widow with the the barrel of meal y'all know the story with Elijah and, and and she but when God honored and God blessed every time she reached in on that barrel there was always enough it never ran dry God always provided and God's always provided for me I can also tell you that barrel never overflows either there's a lot of people who are waiting for God to overflow it and then they'll tithe. They'll say, Lord, after the blessing, then I'll be faithful. That's backwards. You be faithful, and then watch God bless. If we're in this study of faith and blessing, we're not as pie in the sky like, like these preachers that are out there trying to get their hand into your wallet. I'm not trying to get my hand in your wallet. I'm trying to get you on your knees before God, worshiping him, bowing before him, honoring him with the first fruits first, and letting God handle the rest. You do that, we're good. We're fine. And you will understand that God does amazing things. You may say, I, don't, I can't tithe. I don't know that I can't tithe. I can't afford it. Let me read to you what my dear friend King David said about it. In the Old Testament, Psalms 37. By the way, if you did not know, that's my favorite psalm. Isn't that right, Trevor? Amen. I got eight sermons I preach out of Psalms 37. Love it to death. I can stretch it to 10, but I usually do it in eight. Hear this, Psalms 37, verse 25. I once was young. Now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. You know what David's saying? I've been around a long time, and I've, been, I've seen a lot of things, but you know, I've never seen somebody who's seeking to honor God that God left them begging. God takes care of it. God knows you're not perfect, but he also knows how much you trust him. Listen to me now. He knows the intent of your heart. Matthew, you want to hear what Jesus says about this? The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verse number 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God 
and mammon. King James, New King James uses the word mammon. But the, we don't use that word today. The word means money or wealth. You cannot serve God and money. One's going to be Lord. The love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, James says. You hear me? Jesus said, you can't have two masters. Malachi chapter 3 says it this way. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse. I had a church member one time, wouldn't tithe for nothing. But if there was something in the church that, that they were doing, then they would say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll tithe and we'll pay for that so that they could get the benefit from it. That's not tithing. Bring all your tithes into the storehouse. Let God handle it. That there may be food in my house. And then, listen to this phrase. And try me now in this. He says, if you'll try it, you'll find out that I'll honor it. If you'll be faithful and worship me and allow me, I'll bless you. Look what else he says. In Malachi 3.10, he says, Try me now in this. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there will not be enough room to receive it. You know what he says? Try me and see if I won't open the vault of the glory in heaven and let the, let the treasures just pour out upon you. Luke 6. Luke 7, excuse me. No, excuse me, I'm right. Luke 6, the end of, of chapter 6. Watch and see that I will not give you more than you could even comprehend. That's Jesus saying that. Jesus saying that. A couple Wednesday nights ago, I was preaching on Luke chapter 7. I was preaching on Jesus going to a funeral service on the widow of Nain. Her husband had died, now her child had died, and Jesus walked up on the funeral service, and the uh, Bible says he had compassion on her, reached up, touched that coffin, and the dead one that was in that coffin just sat up, began to speak. They, don't you know the ones carried him, let him down in a hurry? He got up and got out and probably went. And, I don't know if he gave Jesus a high five or not, it doesn't tell us. He probably gave that mom a hug. And don't you know she let a squeal loose? She hit a note. Mark had never even thought about singing in that right there. Because she, she had seen the God of the resurrection do beyond what she could have ever dreamed of. Not too long after that, John the Baptist was in jail and he was saying, he asked his servants, go and ask Jesus, are you the one or do we look for another? They came, those servants of John the Baptist came, and, and he said, you just tell them what you've seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. But then he says this phrase, listen to me, y'all ever heard of the Beatitudes? Come on now, y'all ever heard of Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit? Y'all heard of those? This is the unforgotten and the overlooked Beatitude. Luke chapter 7, verse 23. When he said to those servants of John, just go tell him what you see. But then he says this word, and blessed is he who is not offended at me. Blessed is the one who hears me, and is not offended at my words, but by faith receives my words and seeks to live my words why is it that when I preach on tithing I get the most amens and the most code shoulders sometimes you'll hear people say something like this a non-believer a non-participator will say something like well you just don't know my circumstances at which I want to look at them and say you're right I don't understand your circumstances, but I know the one who does. Isaiah 55, verse 8. says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And your ways 
not as high as my ways, says the Lord. For if the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You may not understand it, but that doesn't change it. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I understand that. God's ways are greater than our ways, but I'm not offended at them. Folks, I don't understand grace, but I don't wait around until I do understand it before I participate in it. I don't understand why God gives mercy. I don't. But I'm not going to wait around until I do understand it before I participate in it. Matter of fact, Luke 6 says this. In the same way that you judge, you will be judged. And in the way that you condemn, usually out of ignorance, out of misinformation and not understanding. When you condemn, he says, in the way that you condemn, you'll be condemned. The way that you judge, you'll be judged. And then he says this, and in the way that you give, it will be given to you. He actually says this, and the, and the measure that you meet, it will be measured out to you. And the way that you give, you will receive. Hold on, that's not my words. Are y'all good with that? That's not my theory, but I've practiced it. I've lived it, and I've never seen God come up short. I love being able to preach through something like this, and, and I'm not picking out, I'm going to preach on this today, or the tithes were down a little bit, so I'm going to preach a little harder on tithing. Listen, over this COVID experience, I'm not yelling at New Holland Baptist Church. In July, our tithes were higher than any other month of the year. That would have been a good time to say amen. Oh, please. Amen. Thank you, Bradley. I'm not mad at you. I'm preaching the countenance of God. I'm preaching the truths of God. But I know one thing for certain. Not everybody tithes. Not everybody's seen the full bounty of God. We got more tippers than we got tithers. We got, we got people who are still overwhelmed by their circumstances. We got people who are saying, well, as soon as this clears up, then I'll be able to. No, you won't. You're either going to trust God now or you're not. You're going to judge people, and when you do, you'll be judged by the same manner. You're going to continue to condemn people, and when you do, you're going to be condemned in the same manner. God, listen. But when you give, when you trust, when you worship, when you honor, when you love, when you witness, you're freeing up the Lord of heaven, Malachi says, to open up the doors and the treasury and let the bounty flow. Do you love him? How much do you love him? Do you trust him? Are you offended that he asked you to witness? Are you offended that he asked you to be faithful? Are you offended that the Bible says do not uh, forsake the assembling of yourself together? Today, we've had less people show up in the building here than any other day, including our first day back from COVID. Yet, I see people at Walmart and Kroger. I see people around, yet they haven't come back to the house of God. Whether they're being safe, I understand that. I've asked you to be safe. I've told you to be safe. I've told you that, that you need to put your health first. We got somebody sitting back there who was in the hospital not too long ago wearing a mask and is in the service today. Praise God for that. Praise God that people's worship's going to come out. Praise God that they're going to put God first, foremost. Praise God that the love is seen and it's felt. And there are so many people who says, yes, let me testify how much I love God. But they're offended that he asked them to do some things. Listen to Jesus' words. He had just told John the disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, just tell him all the things that I'm doing. 
And he was just about to brag on John the Baptist and call him the greatest born of woman. But before he bragged on John the Baptist, he said, hold on. Blessed is he who is not offended at me. I may not understand all the things that God's word tells me, but my heart must seek to live them. Trust the Lord in this. Try the Lord in this. I miss revivals. I used to preach a whole bunch of revivals. I, I, I miss the time when we set a week aside. We come, and we, get, we get our bucket full. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It? And we'd sing, and we'd worship, we'd hear, we'd get preached at, and a lot of times when I would preach a revival, the Lord would lead me to preach on tithing. Oh, that preacher of ours, he told you to preach on tithing. I said, no, your preacher didn't tell me, but my Lord did. And I, I thought it was funny, Brother Mark. Sometimes you could see a correlation between how much revival they got and how much obedience and repentance that you saw among the people. When they got fired up to repent, when they got fired up to trust God, it seemed like there was more of movement of the hand of God among his people. I miss those days. I miss those days you preach so hard and so long. I didn't wear, I wore a tie back then. I preached until, you know, just sweat yourself to death. And I miss that feeling of absolute abandonment of everything else that you, you felt among the people of God, that God would be worshipped no matter what. It wasn't a hard thing for people to come back the second night and the third night and the fourth night and the fifth night. They couldn't get enough. I miss those days. I'm not speaking on tithing because I'm trying to raise money for this or raise money for that. Our budget takes care of, our, care of all that. I, I, I bless you and I praise you for what you're doing. But I just wonder, what is it that God's telling us that he's wanting to do in our life? And the one thing that's standing in the way for the blessing is the faith that comes before the blessing. Do you love him? Do you trust him? Is he Lord of all? Do you trust him with all? Let's pray. My Lord, my God, my Savior, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I thank you for the opportunity to worship you. I thank you for the opportunity to speak the name of Jesus, to preach the word, to give, to pray, to sing. Lord, to shout, you are good, you are great, you are God, and I am grateful. Lord, it is my privilege to call you my God. And Lord, it is my honor to call you my friend. Lord, it is a privilege to reach up a hand and to grab hold of the throne of grace. And Lord, to pray blessings upon your people. Lord, help us come together. Help us to be one. Jesus, I'm thankful that we don't need another priest. Lord, that you came as the priest to, be in the, to stand in the gap for us, to make a way. And Lord, I give it all. I honor you. I bow before you. I won't bow my knee before any other. But Lord, I privilege to bow my knee before you Lord please hear this invitation you know our actions are intense in our heart so Lord I pray that the words of our mouth the meditations of our heart right now will be pleasing unto you and in the ways where we need to repent may we repent so that you can receive those as well Lord bless us Holy Spirit, speak. May there be no spirit that's in charge in this service today other than you, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, wherever you put your finger on any area of our life, may we honor you by giving that unto you. In Jesus' name I pray as we surrender unto you. Amen.